during the history of the last century, uh, most of the major decisions uh, regarding uh, the land of Israel, regarding uh, the partition of Palestine, uh, have been made by outside powers. Have been made uh, not by the people who live here, but rather by uh, world powers. And that situation still exists today, where the latest proposition uh, is uh, made by uh, Europe and the United Nations and Russia and the United States, and uh, is to a great extent intended to be imposed upon the people who live in this country. The uh, series of lectures uh, here uh, deal with uh, three attempts earlier uh, to impose some sort of solution. Uh, what those attempts were, the people that were involved, and why, to a great extent, uh, those attempts really were unsuccessful. The first uh, that I'm going to deal with tonight uh, deals with the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. Uh, there's a wonderful book uh, that was recently published called Paris 1919, Six Months to Change the World. And it's the story of the Versailles Conference and of the four men who uh, played the leading role, Lloyd George for England and Clemenceau for France, Wilson for the United States, and Orlando for Italy, and of the uh, different personalities and clashes of national interest which occurred. And I think a great deal of this is very relevant to us because we think of Europe or of France or of England of the BBC and uh, the Independent uh, and, and the Guardian in England as uh, being creations of the 21st century, when in reality they reflect a position uh, that was uh, very strong in England uh, 80, 90 years ago. We think of France uh, as being France, but France was always France. And the uh, pressures, therefore, on the uh, uh, people of Israel, and the pressures on the Arabs as well, are of long standing. They didn't begin today. And I think that if we see it in that historic backdrop, we can see that this current uh, roadmap or whatever plan is advanced is really only part of a continual chain of the attempt of outside powers uh, to somehow impose a settlement on uh, very reluctant participants here in this part of the world. The uh, hero, as far as the Zionist movement is concerned, in the story of 1919 is Chaim Weizmann. Weizmann has never received his due in the state of Israel because Ben-Gurion didn't allow him to have it. Uh, but uh, Weizmann is really the architect of uh, the Jewish national home of the Jewish state in the land of Israel. Weizmann is a Jew from Pinsk, uh, he, from Motala. He uh, is a, uh, receives a traditional Jewish education. He is an observant Jew until he's about 17. He then leaves for Germany, and in Germany he becomes secularized, but he doesn't become de-Judaized. And in fact, at the end of his life, he returned to become an observant Jew. Uh, Weizmann uh, is a very complicated person, as all of us are. The greater we are, the more complicated we are. Take it from me. <laughs> and... Uh, Weizmann, uh, he was described as a well-fed Lenin. He looked like Lenin, he was bald and had a goatee, but he was a much bigger person than Lenin, and uh, he certainly uh, 
was as devoted to his cause as Lenin was to his cause. However, uh, Weizmann did not use Lenin's uh, tactics and ruthlessness to achieve it. Uh, Weizmann uh, becomes a uh, chemist. And not the world's greatest chemist, but a chemist. And uh, eventually, he moves from Germany, because he found German Jews very distasteful. They were far too assimilated for him. Uh, he regretted the fact that they uh, saw themselves as Germans overseeing themselves as Jews. Uh, he, uh, he was almost prescient regarding the fact that German Jewry would pay a terrible tr price uh, for their assimilation. And uh, he moves to England, and he becomes a uh, reader that's like an assistant professor. It's not a full professor. Uh, but he said that he's not even a professor. He, evidently, he, he, uh, he objected to the fact that he didn't uh, see, receive the uh, recognition that he should have in a university outside of Manchester. And uh, in uh, the early, as early as 1906, he already meets Balfour, who then is the Prime Minister of England. And Balfour is one of the most complicated, again, people in this story. Balfour was a bachelor, he never married. Uh, he was a, uh, an English aristocrat. He was one of the wealthiest men in England. His father left him a fortune. Uh, he was very conversant with the Bible. Uh, he had a great belief in religion, uh, but he was very well known uh, for not being a uh, doer. Uh, Winston Churchill said that if you want nothing done, Balfour's your man. <laughs> and uh, Balfour was an exceptional speaker. Uh, he and Churchill were the two main orators in the House of Commons. Churchill once asked him what his secret was of uh, oratory. He said, I say what I have in mind, and I sit down after the first grammatical sentence. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, to put it mildly, Weizmann and Balfour are an odd couple, very unlikely uh, to be friends. Now, Balfour is related to the famous Cecil family in England. The Cecils were, uh, uh, from the time of Queen Elizabeth, were the nobility of England, uh, always served in the government, always held positions of high importance, always were people of influence. And this little Jew from Motola, who as he himself described, he says, not even being a professor in a medium rate, college in England is able to insinuate himself into English upper society. And he's able somehow to make friends with people who are very, very powerful and are influential. His entire passion in life, Weizmann's, was Zionism. And he envisioned uh, the creation of a Jewish national homeland in the land of Israel. But he was not very well accepted by English Jewry. Uh, for most of English Jewry, he was too Russian. And for the R Russian immigrant generation, he was too English. And uh, in the Zionist movement itself, he had very, very many opponents. Uh, but he was the only person that had these connections. He was the only one that had entree to world leaders. And because of that, uh, uh, the other uh, members of the Zionist committee uh, had to, so to speak, uh, get along with him, even though uh, mo most of the time they didn't agree with his policies, and they also found his personality difficult to deal with. Here in the land of Israel itself, there grew up a different group of leaders. A socialist, uh, Weizmann was a semi-socialist. 
but uh, here uh, there were full socialists, left-wing socialists, Marxists, uh, that eventually took over the Zionist movement, and they were the main powers in the country. And uh, they uh, uh, felt that uh, Weizmann was not strong enough, not strong enough on socialism, not strong enough on Zionism. And uh, therefore, uh, they developed a parallel uh, leadership of the Zionist movements. So you had a world Zionist movement, which was led by Weizmann, but you had a local Zionist movement actually on the ground here in the land of Israel, which was... Uh, led by the Histadrut and uh, by Ben-Gurion, uh, and that was a completely different group of people with uh, different ideas, uh, to a certain extent different goals. The First World War breaks out. Now, in the First World War, the Jews fought on both sides. Uh, there were Jews in the Austrian and German armies. Uh, there were Jews in the English, French, and Russian armies. Uh, the question was, uh, who would the Jews support in the war? Now, one of the myths that constantly exists is that Jews, uh, who the Jews support somehow is very important. It can, in fact, be the make or break in the war. Why people believe that, uh, it's hard to fathom. Uh, a lot of it is because of the protocols of the elders of Zion, which the world believes, no matter how many times we deny it. Everyone thinks that there's a committee of Jews, of which I am a member, <laughs> uh, that sit down once a month and decide the fate of humanity. And as uh, preposterous as that it scheme is, it nevertheless is accepted in vast areas of the world as being true, and to a certain extent, it's accepted even by political leaders and leaders of countries who certainly should know better. And uh, because of that, therefore, there was a great sentiment of Jews that supported originally uh, Germany in the war because of their hatred to the Tsar of Russia. The Tsar of Russia and the Russian government was bitterly anti-Semitic. Uh, the Jews suffered terribly uh, for the last, uh, for the entire 19th century under the hand of the Romanovs, the Russian Tsars, and therefore uh, there was a natural inclination uh, that they wanted to see the Tsar defeated. They wanted to see his government brought down. The Russian government compounded that by anti-Jewish decrees in the war. Uh, they made uh, almost a half a million Jews refugees, forced them to move out of Lithuania and eastern Poland, and sent them to, deep into Russia. And uh, because of that, therefore, the underlying feeling was that somehow the Jews supported Germany. England was afraid of that. And because England was afraid of that, uh, Weizmann had a lever. And the lever was that if England would come out in favor of the Zionist movement, uh, the Jews would certainly support the Allies. Now, for propaganda purposes, France also agreed that uh, if they could get Jewish support, somehow that would help the war cause. And therefore, France took a very pro-Jewish, official pro-Jewish line, uh, anti, uh, uh, against any anti-Semitism, even though France has not yet recovered from the Dreyfus Affair. And it still has until today. And... Uh, uh, you had this atmosphere uh, regarding uh, who the Jews would support. The Jews didn't even realize this, right? I mean, if you asked, uh, you know, a, a Jew in, you know, between Mincha of what he thought about the war, right? So, you know, he didn't, no one thought in those terms, but somehow in the official circles of the British government and the British Foreign Office, this was part of the consideration. 
Also, there was the belief, uh, and that was correct, uh, England was bled dry by the First World War. Uh, it had to borrow money in order to finance it. It borrowed money in the United States. Many uh, of the uh, offerings of the British government, bonds, etc., were floated by uh, Jewish concerns on Wall Street. And uh, it's interesting that in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, uh, the Japanese had to borrow money, and they were financed by uh, Jacob Schiff, by Bear Stearns and Company, by Zeligman and Company, the Jewish bankers who really were against Russia because of the Tsar, and they helped the Japanese win the war. And since that was 1905, and this is 1914, it's a short period of time, it's not even the blink of an eye as far as history is concerned, uh, so that was uppermost also in their minds, that the Jewish money, quote-unquote, even though there was much more non-Jewish money in the world, there still is, but that the Jewish money had to somehow support the Allies because the bankers were also floating German bonds at the same time and Austro-Hungarian bonds at the same time. Uh, so therefore, the, Weizmann had this lever of this belief of Jewish influence and power. The second lever that he had was a personal one. Uh, the British, uh, uh, the, uh, the, no one estimated correctly what the cost of the First World War would be in lives, in time, in money. Uh, everyone thought it was going to be a short, brisk war, six weeks, eight weeks. Then they said six months. No one saw it stretching longer than four years. No one saw that 20 million men would be killed. No one saw what the, uh, that every empire would be destroyed by it. Uh, no one realizes the consequences of this struggle. One of the things was that they expended artillery shells at an enormous rate. Uh, in the Battle of Ypres, uh, more than a million artillery shells were fired by the British. All to no avail. Now, to make artillery shells operate correctly, you needed a uh, chemical compound called acetone. Because otherwise the shell would not explode at the right height. And if the shell doesn't explode at the right height and just buries itself in the ground like a cannonball, it really has minimal effect. And the British didn't have a method for mass production of acetone. Weitzman, for some reason or other, and I, I'm, this entire lecture has nothing to do with God or religion. I'm leaving it out of the uh, mix completely, uh, though everyone can reinsert it uh, at the proper time when they think about it. He figured out a way to synthetically produce acetone in great quantities. And he gave this patent to the British government without charge, though he could have become a multimillionaire from it. And he gave it to them without charge, and he said, I have no personal desire, no personal favors to ask. My only favor is that you look at the Jewish people favorably and at the cause of the Zionist movement and that you help advance it. Now, uh, neither the Jewish money nor this uh, magnanimous gesture by Weizmann would have been enough to affect British policy if it were not that British policy and the Zionist movement uh, came close to each other at the end of 1916 and beginning of 1917 because of the length of the war. And what happened was uh, that uh, England and France uh, had a secret uh, treaty called the Sykes-Picot Treaty in which uh, they divided up the Middle East uh, between themselves. But of course, not having occupied the Middle East, uh, that was a problem. But uh, in the, you have to have the mindset of imperialism before imperialism became a bad word. Today, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the communist world made imperialism into a, uh, into a pejorative term, into a negative word. 
So nobody today is an imperialist. But imperialism in the 19th century was a positive term. And it was uh, the advance of civilization. It was how we were going to teach uh, the poor natives how to govern themselves, how to have uh, health and hospitals and uh, laws and courts and an economy. Uh, and imperialism and colonialism went hand in hand. And they were both seen as uh, progressive, a means of educating the world, of bringing everyone up to European standards. And uh, in this treaty, the Sykes-Picot Treaty, uh, it was agreed that France would have what is today Lebanon and Syria, and that England would have uh, what is today Iraq, and uh, Palestine, which then included what is today Jordan as well, because England needed to protect its interest in the Suez Canal in Egypt, and therefore it needed all the territory uh, coming south to the Sinai Desert, to Egypt, as a buffer in order to protect its interest in the Suez Canal, which in turn protects the English uh, interest in India, England never imagined giving up India. It was the uh, jewel in the empress's crown. And uh, therefore, uh, this was all part of the real politic of the time. France saw itself from the time of the Crusades onwards as the protector of Christian interests in the Middle East. That's how France sees itself. And even though today there are very few Christian interests left in the Middle East, uh, but France sees itself as a major player, even though uh, uh, realistically it, uh, it is very peripheral to anything that goes on here. And, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, treaty, therefore, uh, between uh, France and England became the basis of what the division would be in the Middle East. At the beginning of 1917, the war turned very badly against the Allies. Uh, the German submarine warfare uh, almost uh, brought England to its knees. England was dependent upon imports of, uh, of everything, of food and coal and of uh, uh, munitions. Uh, everything had to be imported. England couldn't support itself in the war. And uh, here you had now unlimited submarine warfare. Uh, the English blockaded Germany, so Germany was half starving, but England was also half starving. And uh, England was afraid the, uh, all of the uh, major offensives on the Western Front had turned into nothing, into just bloodbaths. So England came up with, an, uh, with the, uh, really it was Churchill's idea originally, to try and win the war by coming in the Middle East, by knocking Turkey out of the war. Turkey was uh, the ally of Germany and of Austria. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire was the, called the sick man of Europe. It was corrupt. It was, uh, they thought that would be an easy way to get out. And England sent an expeditionary force to the Middle East under General Allenby. I think every major a uh, city in Israel has an Allenby Street, named after Major Allenby, after Major General Allenby. And uh, Allenby uh, and the British uh, attempted to unseat the Turks from the Middle East. They had two allies. They had the Arabs and they had the Jews, both of whom wanted to get rid of Turkey. It was obvious to the Zionist movement that as long as the Ottoman Empire ruled Palestine, there never would be a Jewish homeland because the Muslims would not agree to it. And therefore, it was necessary somehow to eliminate Muslim control of the country. The Arabs were being exploited terribly by the Ottomans, by the Turks. The Arabs wanted to have their own countries, their own nationalism. They wanted to have their own uh, uh, freedom, so to speak something which they have never achieved. And because of that, therefore, you had these two forces, both of which 
uh, were uh, against Turkey. England played on both of them at the same time. Because when you're in desperation and you have to win the war, uh, you do what you have to do now without realizing what the consequences will necessarily be later. So they made conflicting promises to both sides. Now in, in uh, what is today Saudi Arabia, uh, then it was ruled by the Hashemite family. The Saudis, the Saud family, didn't uh, take over until 1923 when they uh, destroyed the Hashemites and drove them out, and the, the Saudis made a, uh, an alliance with the Wahhabi uh, Muslims uh, in order to uh, take over the country, and that's how this extreme form of fundamentalist Islam came to control is, uh, the Saudi uh, Arabian Peninsula. And also, no one knew then that there was oil. Then it was worthless. It was just sand. Sand in Mecca. In fact, the main income in the country was the tourism of the Muslim uh, pilgrims to uh, Mecca. And then all of a sudden, they discover that 40% uh, uh, of the world's oil reserves lie under those sands. And that changed the whole picture completely. Now, what would have been had the Hashemites uh, continued? Uh, there are a lot of what could have beens here in history. What could have been had the Hashemites continued to rule? Uh, who knows? But the Saudis came to rule. In any event, uh, uh, Hussein, who was the uh, sheriff of Mecca, the head of the Hashemites, and his son Faisal, and Faisal was really the head of the Arabs, mounted a rebellion against the Turks, and they, it's the famous story of Lawrence of Arabia, etc. So they attacked the Turks. The Jews uh, here in the land of Israel, the Turks persecuted them terribly. Most of the Zionist leaders were driven out of the country. Uh, Ben-Gurion spent uh, the war in the United States, in New York. Uh, Ben-Zvi, they were all driven out of the country. But there were Jewish organizations here also that opposed the Turks, spied for the British. Eventually, uh, Weizmann uh, put enormous pressure on uh, Balfour, and uh, the, uh, in a really a strange way, uh, Balfour uh, convinced the British government to issue a declaration on behalf of Zionism. Now, Balfour was opposed in the English cabinet by a Jew by the name of Montague. And Montague said uh, very openly, he said that, uh, I cannot conceive a worse bondage to which to relegate an advanced and intellectual community such as England as the support of Zionism. He asked, what is to become of the people of the country? He said, it is a mischievous political creed untenable by any patriotic citizen of the United Kingdom. Uh, it was because of Montague uh, that the Balfour Declaration was watered down. Because originally it was a much stronger statement in support of Zionism and in support of Jewish rights in the country. Weizmann's answer to this, very strange answer, they asked him, well, what is your right to the country? And he said, our right to the country is memory, which made an impression on Lloyd George. Lloyd George said later that he knew all the names of all the kings of Israel, but he knew none of the names of the kings of Wales. And, he said, and they had a uh, strange... Uh, religious attachment to the country. And they saw it as being somehow a noble deed that would survive them. Balfour on his deathbed said that the Balfour Declaration uh, was the noblest thing that he ever did in his life. And it's interesting that uh, Balfour is practically remembered by no one except the Jews. It would not have been for the Balfour Declaration. Uh, someone pointed out to me that there were more streets in Israel named Balfour than in England.
So in uh, 1917, the Balfour Declaration uh, is proclaimed. The Balfour Declaration says that it, we support a Jewish national homeland in, the, in Palestine and we'll do everything possible to facilitate it uh, pro, without prejudicing the rights of the non-Jewish population. Now, how do you make a Jewish national homeland without prejudicing the rights of the other people who are not Jews? No one explained that. And the Balfour Declaration was immediately rejected by all of the Arabs, by uh, all of the Muslims, uh, as being uh, completely unacceptable, and uh, that they would never abide by its rules or by its tenets. But Weizmann saw it as a tremendous triumph, which it was. And Weizmann's belief was that a Jewish national homeland could be built here in the country, but that there was no necessity to build a Jewish state. In other words, it would be an England, this, the country would belong to England. Uh, England would be uh, the defense, uh, it would be the foreign policy, it would be the economy, it would be governed by the British, but that there would be an autonomous Jewish society in the country uh, that would uh, be able to develop, etc., etc. And his idea was that the state was a long time in coming. He talked in terms of centuries. Now, all of this was changed naturally by the Holocaust, which no one saw coming at all. And uh, that, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that in the next lecture when we discuss uh, uh, what happened in 47. But here we're in 1919. Now, in the, uh, in the peace conference, uh, every little group in the world came before the peace conference and advanced its uh, claim to being a nation. Uh, part of the problem was that uh, Woodrow Wilson, in his 14 points, stressed the idea of self-determination, meaning that every group of people had a right to decide for themselves where they were going to live and under which government. All of the countries in Europe had minorities. All of the minorities came forth and said, we don't want to be a minority, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be part of Austria, we don't want to be part of Hungary, we don't want to be part of Romania, we want to be a country by ourselves. Well, if you did that, there'd be 80 little countries in Europe. And therefore, this concept of self-determination ran into the uh, reality of, uh, of nations, how they exist. So they tried to find the balance. Uh, Czechoslovakia, for instance, they created a new country. And they uh, put together two people who didn't like each other, uh, the Czechs and the Slovaks. So and today we see that they have separated into two separate countries. But uh, during the peace conference, they were very uh, adamant that the, that the Czechoslovakian entity be created. Uh, Banish, Masaryk, all of the, the Czechs uh, represented it. And the Slovaks wanted to be separate, but they said the countries couldn't exist separate. They forced them together and they created that country. In Poland, you had the Tremendous problem of minorities. And uh, so the Poles had to agree, in order to have an independent Poland, that they would respect uh, all of the rights and religions and everything of the minorities in Poland. Well, naturally, when it came to the Jews, that was not enforced. And Poland, between the wars, was terribly anti-Semitic on an official basis into this, uh, but they kept on coming, uh, all the people in the Balkans. So we have all of that today. We have Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Serbia uh, and Croatia and Slovenia. All of that, uh, came, they all came to this peace conference. They all said, we want to be our own. And the uh, power politics of the time, so they forced them all together into... Uh, Yugoslavia, which was uh, the southern Slavs, uh, dominated mainly by Serbia, 
but uh, you had a lot of Muslims there, and the, uh, and, uh, the Serbians were uh, Orthodox Christians, and you had a lot of Roman Catholics. It was, uh, it was a formula destined for trouble. And as long as there were dictators in the country, so the dictators held it together. The moment Tito and everybody else fell apart, so then we saw uh, a decade of wars and uh, the fact that there are still American troops uh, in the former Yugoslavia to keep people from killing each other. Into this mix walked the Zionist movement. And they say, we want Palestine. Palestine is ours. And they were supported by Britain because of the Balfour Declaration. And they were opposed by France. France opposed from the beginning. And so then the question was, who was going to have the mandate over Palestine? And France was determined to block Britain. And in blocking Britain, they had to block the Zionists. So. At this commission, uh, many groups of Jews came to testify. So the Zionist movement marshaled all of its forces, uh, Usishkin, uh, who testified in Hebrew, and uh, Nochem Sokolov, and Weizmann, and all of the leading Zionists, Brandeis. But there also were the anti-Zionists who came to testify. Uh, the Orthodox anti-Zionists uh, came to testify against, and the assimilated uh, Jews came, you know, politics means very strange bedfellows. The assimilated Jews came and testified against, and France insisted that there be two French Jews who would speak. One was André Spire, who was a poet, and a leading figure in French Jewry, and Sylvain Levy, who was a distinguished scholar in a French university. And they were told by the French government, we are anxious to have a French Zionist make a statement which can be construed as being favorable to Zionism. But you should try to make it clear that France must have Palestine. Uh, Spire uh, made a half-hearted statement, but Levy came out openly, and he said, as a Frenchman of Jewish origin, he said the results of enforcing the Balfour Declaration would be disastrous. Weizmann shouted to him in French, I read the English translation, I no longer know you. You are a traitor. But uh, he only raised the same problems that Montague had raised before. The English, however, interestingly enough, were unmoved by all of this. Because of their power politics also, they wanted France excluded from that area. And uh, they uh, saw the Zionist movement as their lever against France, as being able somehow to prevent the French from having the mandate. And therefore, uh, uh, Balfour said, when the Arab delegation came, the Arab delegation came and protested it, so he said, uh, the uh, Arabs are ungrateful people. They're accused of ingratitude. He said, look at all we're giving them. We're giving them the whole Middle East. We freed them from Turkey. And his statement was, I hope remembering all that we have done for you, which is uh, very patronizing, as you can imagine, uh, you will not begrudge that small notch of land, for it is no more geographically than a notch whatever it may be historically, that small notch is what we are now taking from the Arab territories and giving to the people who for all these hundreds of years have been separated from it. Uh, the Arabs didn't take kindly to that statement. 
They did not see it as a small notch of land. They did not see it as being uh, ungrateful. And they saw it as England somehow uh, pursuing its imperialistic goals in the guise of Zionism, something which remains until today. If you hear uh, the, the, what the, uh, the Muslims keep on saying, you know, Israel's the small Satan, America's the great Satan, uh, Israel is just the, uh, the cat's paw uh, in the door, it's really the West that is trying to take over. They want to take our oil. They want to take our, they want to take our culture, etc., etc. So that's what they said in 1919 at the Paris Free, uh, Peace Conference. Weizmann made a gracious speech. He said there is room for both sides to work side by side. Be careful of mischievous insinuations that Zionists are seeking political power. Rather, let both uh, peoples progress together until we are ready for joint autonomy. Now, there was a split in the Zionist movement. There were many that held that the country should be a federal uh, type of a government. Uh, it should be a Jews and Arabs together. There should not be a separate Jewish state. There should not be a separate Arab state. But that together, uh, Magnus, who was the president of Hebrew University, and others supported that idea. It still exists. It floats in the air every so often now also. That somehow that would be a solution to the problem. Weizmann met with Faisal. Now, Faisal was given uh, the Iraq. Uh, uh, as his uh, reward, and uh, Faisal and uh, Weizmann got along fabulously. Weizmann said, however, that Faisal is contemptuous of the Palestinian Arabs, whom he doesn't even regard as legitimate Arabs. So this is in the inter-Arab struggle, which still exists today, uh, the attitude of the other Arab countries towards the Palestinian Arabs. He said to Weizmann, it is curious that there should be any friction between Jews and Arabs. After all, there is plenty of land to go around. Weizmann and Faisal uh, made an agreement uh, that they would live together in peace, uh, but the agreement never came into being because of the problems between Britain and France and between the Jews and the Arabs. And the uh, final uh, recommendation of the commission was to appoint another commission, uh, which would study the matter, because all of a sudden they realized that they had an intractable problem here. Two Americans were appointed to the commission, Charles Crane and Henry King. Uh, they were both businessmen. Uh, one was a businessman and one was a professor. And they came out emphatically against the entire Zionist program. And they recommended that the peace conference limit Jewish immigration and give up completely on the idea of making Palestine a Jewish homeland. England and Woodrow Wilson ignored their recommendation. But here you have already in 1919 the basis of the Arabist position of much of the State Department uh, that uh, the world would be better off uh, without a Zionist presence, without a state of Israel, because it's a problem that cannot be solved. The border, England did a clever thing then. They diverted the conversation as to where the borders of Palestine should be. Now uh, here is the, really the crux of the issue. Is the uh, Zionist movement and the creation of the State of Israel, is that an existential issue? Meaning, does it have a right to exist? Or is it only a territorial issue? It has a right to exist. The question is, how much territory should it have? England jumped the gun and said it's a territorial issue. We're going to negotiate now with France, where the border should be. 
England said it should include uh, much of what is Syria. They drew the border just uh, four kilometers south of Damascus. The French naturally had a fit. And the, uh, they went back to the agreement, the Sykes-Picot agreement, and the border, the international border, uh, between uh, Palestine and Syria and Lebanon uh, was as it was in 1948. Uh, and that was, uh, the, that, so, that, so the French thought that they won because they won the territorial issue. England felt they won because the existential issue disappeared from the table. Lloyd George said to Weizmann, now you have your state. It all depends on you now. And Ben-Gurion paraphrased that in his famous statement, which has not ever been proven true. Ben-Gurion said, it doesn't matter what the nations of the world say, it matters only what the Jewish people do. So that sounds good, but it doesn't resonate in the reality of the world. Now, uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, peace conference, therefore, granted England the mandate. The British Foreign Office uh, by that time was taken over by Lord Curzon, and he said, personally, I am convinced that Palestine will be a rankling thorn in the flesh of whoever is charged with the mandate. And therefore, I would withdraw from this responsibility while we yet can. Churchill said, Palestine is costing us six million pounds a year to hold. The Zionist movement will cause continued friction with the Arabs. The French ensconced in Syria were paid for by not paying what they owe us are opposed to the Zionist movement and will try to cushion the Arabs off onto us as being the real enemy. We should get out. In spite of all of this advice, England did not get out. But England accepted upon itself the mandate, for uh, whatever reasons. And by accepting the mandate, uh, they uh, entered into uh, what were uh, 25 years of constant strife. The Arabs simply repeated that they refused to recognize the Balfour Declaration, the British mandate, and refused to obey any of its uh, orders. Churchill winked at the Zionist movement and he said, you know, uh, we won't mind it if you set up a Zionist governing body, but don't speak of it. All agreed that the Palestinian Arab delegation was a nuisance. Lloyd George suggested cheerfully, why not bribe them? The Prime Minister was full of helpful ideas. He told Balfour to make a big speech again in Albert Hall in London, approving of Zionism. In July 1922, the League of Nations approved the British mandate. As part of approving the British mandate, they also adopted the Balfour Declaration as being, uh, and therefore, the mandate was to bring both the Jews and the Arabs to such a state of civilization that they would be able to have their own government and their own state. The mandate was not meant to last forever, but in the mind of England, it was going to last forever. England never thought of it as being temporary. Weizmann uh, said to Ben-Gurion, who objected to this, uh, uh, Ben-Gurion was, uh, from the beginning, he said that uh, England would not be our salvation. Weizmann said to him, if only we go on working and working in Palestine, then the time will come when there will be another opportunity of giving the mandate its true value. Uh, that time came when England uh, resigned from the mandate, uh, but that would take Hitler and the Second World War to accomplish it. So uh, in effect, if we look back, uh, the year 2003 uh, is not so different than the year 1919. 
and the basic problem that the Arabs did not accept the mandate uh, brought it back to an existential problem and not a territorial problem. And because it remains an existential problem, or in the minds of the Israelis, in our minds it remains an existential problem. And if you listen to the Arab propaganda, that, that type of understanding is reinforced. Uh, so then there's nothing to talk about the territorial problem, because what difference does it make? And uh, the assumptions that England made, uh, that somehow uh, uh, Faisal and Weizmann got along, so therefore the Jews and the Arabs would get along, uh, that assumption was proven wrong uh, almost from the outset. The Arabs rioted in 1921, 1924, 1927, 1929, 1933, 1936, and 1939. So, you know, to have an intifada is, should not be a surprise. It happens every few years. And except the English put it down with enormous force and without television cameras following them and a different mindset in the world regarding all of these things. But the uh, English became convinced uh, that the Zionists were a problem. So England would change its policy 180 degrees. By 1948, when we uh, have uh, tomorrow's brilliant lecture, so uh, we'll see that England supported the Arabs wholeheartedly and was it completely against the Zionist uh, venture and uh, offered, in fact, uh, uh, to evacuate the Jews uh, because they said otherwise uh, the Jews would be destroyed. So uh, this uh, attempt in 1919 to, uh, you have to remember also that in 1919 there were 700,000 people in the country. Out of the 700,000, 560,000 were Arabs. So you had at most 140,000 Jews in the country at the beginning of the mandate. And yet, uh, it was like supposed to be even between the Jews and the Arabs. And as a practical matter, the Jews were more than the Arabs in terms of power, in terms of government, in terms of influence in terms of the economy, in terms of the entire development of the country. So uh, as we have seen uh, throughout the world, uh, the Jews were disproportionate in the country to their population, but not only disproportionate, they gave the impression that somehow there were 10 million Jews here in the country, and that therefore they could do whatever they wanted to do. This uh, uh, rankled, uh, as you can well imagine, the Arabs. And England tried to appease them. They appointed the Grand Mufti. They did all sorts of things to try and appease the Arabs. They limited Jewish immigration. Uh, but none of that changed the facts on the ground in the country. And the facts on the ground in the country was that Tel Aviv developed and the New Jerusalem developed and there were always new settlements and new outposts and and the Jews kept on pushing and pushing, and the Arabs resented every step of the way. And they resented it in the only way that they could, uh, in uh, violence. Once they resent, once you had violence, so then the Jewish defense organizations occurred. The entire uh, dynamic uh, that we see today uh, built up already, and it became almost a self-fulfilling prophecy for both sides as to what was going to happen. Uh, looking back at 1919, it's easy to second guess uh, all of the people at the Versailles Conference. Um, most of the time they come in for terrible criticism because 20 years later the world was at war again, in a worse war, in a more fearsome battle uh, that took many more lives. And so therefore they're looked at as a failure. Uh, but I think on the whole, if you look at it, they had very few choices. They had terrible problems. They had very few choices, very few options. They tried to do the best they could. But as in most matters, uh, you, we learned today in Pirkei Ovo, who's the wise man. So the rabbis gave one answer, a roes anolad, to be able to see the consequences, the future. 
since we're not blessed with prophecy, so no one sees that. You know, we see imperfect hindsight, so we see that maybe uh, the agreements in 1993 were not such good ideas. Maybe uh, the Lebanese War, maybe this, maybe that. But that's all perfect hindsight. But when you're on the ground and you have to make decisions, so then things are not that clear. So in 1919, it wasn't clear to them either. They thought they did a noble thing. They thought they did the right thing. Uh, they thought that this would somehow bring stability and peace to the Middle East, something which the great powers have always sought to do. But as we see that the outside forces have been, able, un been unable, until now at least, to be able to effectuate in that fashion. So uh, that's the beginning of the story, 1919. Tomorrow we'll go to 1947 and 1948, and we'll see how the outside forces then changed but how the results were pretty much the same. Thanks.